Hey friends, Dr. Randy Lane Bunch here, pastor of Connecting Point Church and the founder of Connecting Point Communications. We're delighted you've tuned into the broadcast today and we believe we have a message that's going to be a tremendous blessing for you as we begin to talk today about faith and works. But before we get into the message, as always, we want to remind you of the resources we have free and available for you 24-7 at randylanebunch.org. Of course, that's the Connecting Point Communications website. And under the media link in the main menu, you will find a plethora of resources free and available to you 24-7. We have our magazine, our blog, our podcast. Past editions of our television broadcast can be found right there on our YouTube channel. We would love it if you would go there, subscribe, like, and comment. That would be a great blessing to us. In addition to that, we would love to hear from you. If you would email us at info at connectingpc.org, we would love to hear your praise reports or testimonies. If God has somehow touched you through the viewing of this broadcast, we would love to hear from you. So please email us at info at connectingpc.org. Well, today we're going to be looking in the epistle of James. And we're going to be talking about this important subject of faith and works. There's always a tension uh, in this subject of faith and works. We know that we're justified by faith apart from works, and yet we know from the scriptures that works play an integral part of the believer's life. And so how can we bring balance to this most important subject? We're going to begin to do that today. So in the book of James chapter 2, beginning with verse 14, we read, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is uh, naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things that are needful for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made complete? And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. So see then that a man is justified by works, and not by faith only. And on and on he goes and talks about this quality of faith, um, that those who believe in God will exemplify. And as we said, there's always been a tension between faith and works in the scripture. And it should be that way because this is two sides of the same coin, both of which have their important emphasis, their important point to make. Now, it could be an apocryphal story, we don't know, uh, but we hear that Martin Luther, the great reformer, tore the book of James out of his Bible because he was under the assumption that James was saying we have to supplement good works to faith in order to earn our salvation. And whatever James was saying, he certainly was not saying that. So what was James saying? He wasn't saying anything that was in conflict with the Apostle Paul's message about justification of faith apart from works. He was simply telling us that the faith that justifies will produce works or it will act on what it believes. So he was talking about a quality of faith. James would say to us that saving faith is faith that acts, that responds to and lives in accordance to what it believes. James also spoke of an empty faith, a dead faith, that professes to believe, but at best is superficial in its faith. A dead faith that demonstrates no evidence of its true conviction. And James gives examples of both. In fact, here in verse 21, he gives us a beautiful example with Abraham. It says, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. And if we read on past where we stopped earlier in verse 25 and 26, it says, Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. So here we're talking about the kind of quality of faith that acts on what it believes. Abraham offered his own son up as a burnt offering on the... Uh, Mountain of Moriah. Why would he do such a thing? Because he trusted in God. In fact, the answer to why Abraham did what he did, why um, Rahab the harlot would do what she did, is in, actually in the very definition of the word faith itself. The Greek word for faith is the Greek word 
pistis. And it certainly means to believe in, but that's not all it means. I mean, James says as an example of dead faith that even the devils themselves believe and tremble, but it's certainly not producing any good works in their lives. So what does it truly mean to have faith? What does it mean to believe in God in a biblical sense? Well, the word pistis is not only translated faith, it's also translated faithful. In fact, in Galatians 5, and 23, when talking about the fruit of the Spirit, this word is translated faithfulness, meaning loyalty to. So again, when the Bible says to believe or to have faith, it means to believe in, certainly, but it also means to rely upon and to be committed to or to be loyal to. So when one commits their life to Christ, they're saying, I believe in what you did for me, that you died on the cross. Not only that, but I rely upon you for my salvation. I look to you and believe in you as my Savior. And it also means I commit to you, you are my Lord. It's what I like to call buy-in faith. You know, when you really believe, you throw your lot in with it, right? And that's exactly what this kind of faith does. It says, I used to serve myself, I used to serve my own interests, but now I've come to put my trust in Christ. Now I am a Messiah man, I'm a Jesus man, I belong to him, and I have thrown my lot in with him. I believe in him. So it is a commitment of faith that shifts our allegiance over to Christ. I was reading, actually listening to an audiobook by N.T. Wright on the life of the Apostle Paul, kind of a biographical sketch of the life of Paul that N.T. Wright puts it together. It's in a book simply called Paul by N.T. Wright. And he was talking about Paul's gospel, and he was talking about Paul's use of this word faith. And it's very interesting because many of these concepts in the Roman world would have been transferred to Caesar. He would have been Kyrios or Lord. The Greek word Kyrios is translated Lord. He would have been the one whom you were to look to for your salvation. He's the one that was going to establish universal peace. And Paul plays on that in his gospel and says, no, Caesar is not Lord. Jesus is Lord and you must believe in him. And he defines this word pistis as believing allegiance. I love that. We put our faith in, our trust upon, our reliance in, and our loyalty to Christ. We fully believe in him. And so Caesar is not Lord. Jesus is Lord. He's the one in whom we are committing our trust. He's the one in whom we are believing. And we even see this kind of played out in what we use in Romans 10, 9, and 10 as the foundation for what we call the sinner's prayer. There's no actual sinner's prayer in the Bible, but sometimes we'll pray a prayer with a lost person that wants to put their faith in Christ to help them express their faith in Christ. And here's kind of the foundation for that in Romans 10, 9, and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So again, the faith that saves commits. It's all in. Jesus is Lord. I'm putting my trust in him. And we can see even here that the kind of faith requires a response, an action of response. Here, we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. In other words, it's not just a private faith that we have in our heart. It's something that provokes a response and then afterward produces good works in line with what we say we believe. So again, we act in faith and confess and our faith produces works that are evidence of the kind of faith we have. We believe and we commit to the Lord's uh, lordship. And in fact, that really fits in well with the message of Jesus. The primary message that defined his life and ministry was that of the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, hey, there's a new kingdom coming. It's breaking through even now. It's this kingdom. And he, of course, he's the king of the kingdom. And if you want to become a member of the kingdom, you have to put your faith and your trust in the king. So it's our response to the gospel and the resulting works are the evidence of that believing faith. And really throughout the scriptures, we see the kind of faith that acts, that puts into motion what it says it believes. Let's look at a couple of stories that are probably familiar to us in the scriptures as evidence of this kind of faith that acts, this faith that moves in correspondence to what it professes to believe. Let's look in Mark chapter 5 at the story that we know commonly as the healing of the woman with the issue of blood. And in Mark chapter 5 verse 25, we read, Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? 
But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Now, a while ago, we talked about Romans 10, 9, and 10 and how we're saved by believing in our heart and responding or acting in line with that faith by confessing Jesus as Lord. Well, this woman did exactly the same thing, but her salvation came in a physical context. In fact, in verse 34, when Jesus said, Daughter, your faith has made you well, it's the same Greek word, sozo. We see it there in Mark uh, uh, 5, um, 5, 34, and we see it also in Romans 10, 9, and 10 that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart God raised Jesus from the dead, we'll be sozo, we'll be saved. So this woman believed and acted and was likewise saved. But first of all, what happened? She heard. She heard about Jesus. And of course, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And when she began to hear about Jesus, hope sprung up in her heart. She had spent all that she had going through the medical community, uh, trying doctor after doctor, and thank God for doctors, but sometimes they just simply come to the end of their limitations. And she had tried everything that medical science had to offer and lost all her money and was still sick. So now she hears about Jesus. People are being healed through his ministry. And all of a sudden it begins to spark a hope. And then she begins to get motivated to put her faith, some feet to her faith, we could say. So the very first thing, the Bible says that she came behind him in the press for she had said. In fact, it's in the continual presence in the Greek. She kept saying to herself, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. What is that? She's believing it in her heart. She's saying it with her mouth. She's following it up by actions, by coming in the crowd behind him. And she touches the hem of his garment. It was an act, but it was an act of faith. Now, when Jesus feels her touch, he doesn't feel her touch per se. He feels power flow out of him in response to her faith. And he said, who touched me? And the disciples thinking, dear Lord, is he having sunstroke? What's going on with him? Everybody's touching him. But see, there was something distinctive about her touch. Their touch was just a physical action. Her touch was motivated by faith. You could say she was justified or saved by her works that were motivated through her faith. So her faith was a saving faith, a complete faith that acted on what it believed. She was saved through her faith. She was healed by her faith, but that faith was evidenced in her actions. And the Bible said when uh, she saw what she, uh, when Jesus wanted to see who had done this thing, in other words, who performed this act of faith, and she fell down before him and said, it's me. And uh, he said, daughter, your faith has made you well. But it was the kind of faith that was put in action. We see the same thing in the story of blind Bartimaeus. In Acts chapter 10, we see this faith in action, this faith that saves. Faith that saves is faith that acts. No, we're not saved by earning anything through our works, but it's our works that are evidence of a believing faith. And here we read in Mark chapter 10, beginning with verse 46. Now they came to Jericho. As he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he had heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said, Rabbi, that I, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. So once again, we see this beautiful faith in action. Blind Bartimaeus He's blind, but he hears it's Jesus. Now, he's already heard of Jesus, obviously, because the moment he realizes Jesus is coming through town, he begins to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. And when the crowd tries to silence him, he just ignores them and continues to cry out all the more. You know, everybody wants the testimony, but not everybody is willing to go through the test. And sometimes when you're trying to act in faith, others will try to discourage you. But there is a faith that will not be denied. He continues to cry out. Now, he can't just go to Jesus like the one with the issue of blood. He's blind. But he just tenaciously, out of his faith, begins to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And I love this. Jesus stood still. It was the faith of this blind man that was, as it were, uh, causing God to respond to his faith. And so Jesus called him. And of course, now everybody's on his side. Everybody's excited about the fact that now this man's going to receive a miracle from Jesus. He says, what do you want me to do from you? And he said, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. And what did Jesus say to him? The same thing he said to the woman with the issue of blood. Go your way. Your faith has sozo. Your faith has saved you. It has made you well. 
and he followed Jesus in the way. So once again, we have someone who's heard, someone who's believed, but they're not just sitting back saying, oh yeah, I believe Jesus. Yeah, he does miracles. And it's wonderful that all these people have been healed through the ministry of Jesus. No, it got him in motion. And I'm sub submitting to you, friend, that when you believe, you get in motion. You begin to act on your convictions. You begin to act in line with what you believe. I think it's so beautiful to see their faith in, uh, at work. Faith is not the opposite of effort. Faith is the opposite of earning. See, these people weren't trying to earn their salvation, but they were making certainly an effort in the light of what they believed to get to Jesus. And likewise, friend, I'm submitting to you that when you truly believe, it produces action and effort in your life. I'll never forget, there was a number of years ago, I was in the traveling ministry, traveling throughout the United States, even limitedly abroad, uh, having a wonderful time in the ministry. But after about six years, God began to deal with me about a change of season. I could begin to sense something internally changing on the inside of me. The grace began to live for traveling ministry. And I began to realize God was beginning to refocus my attention in a new direction. So for about six months, because I believed that, I began to seek God earnestly. And for about six months, I didn't have exactly clarity. I just became more and more persuaded and convinced this season's over. I'm in a season of transition. Something new is coming down the pike. And sure enough, one day when I'm in the state of Vermont, where I ministered quite a bit, I ministered a lot in the New England area, I'm in the state of Vermont. I remember I was on one particular side of the street. I looked up, happened to see the house on the other side of the street, and nothing special about that moment other than God spoke to me instantly in that moment. So I want you to come to the state of Vermont. I want you to plant a church. And we did that, and we spent 10 years in the state of Vermont, about 16 years total between traveling and pastoring. But when we began to hear that uh uh, direction from God, we began to get in motion right away. The very first thing we began to do was pray about that new season. Every night until we finally moved to Vermont some months later, we prayed just about every night, praying out the details, getting the mind of God for that season of transition and what it would look like when we went there to plant a church. Secondly, we began to transition. We quit booking meetings on the road to go out and travel and instead we began to gear up for our season of pastoring in the state of Vermont. We began to share our vision with people. The next thing we did was we scoped out the, the area. We went and did some reconnaissance. I made it my business to get to Vermont as many times as I could. I was ministering a lot in the New England area anyway. And so I had a particular friend I preached for a number of times that lived in New Hampshire. And I said, John, can I come preach in your church? I want to go scope out Burlington, only about a three hour drive from John's place. So he said, sure, come on over. We held a meeting and that meeting helped provide the funds for me to go up and scout out and do some reconnaissance in the Burlington area where we eventually established our church. And so we visited the area. Uh, number four, we, locate, we began to establish a partnership program. We began to share with all those New England pastors and churches that had known us for a number of years that God had spoken to our hearts to go to the state of Vermont and plant a church. And as a result of that, because they knew our ministry and we were a proven commodity to them, they began to get behind us and begin to support us financially. A number of the churches supported us $200, $300, $150, $150 every single month. It didn't underwrite our total expense, but it sure gave us a, 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 a jump start. And so we got some small part-time jobs and were able to pastor our church and get it rolling. And then of course we began to tell family and friends and fellow ministers. And then lastly, I remember printing business cards. Why? Because I believed I was going to Vermont. <laughs> because that's what God had said to me. And because I believed it in my heart, I was committed to it and I began to act in line with that. And you know what? God honored our faith. I'll never forget, we didn't have a house to live in there. We went by faith and we didn't even have a house yet. And what we didn't know is in the Burlington area, because of the local college there, it was very difficult to get housing. And so I remember we applied for one particular house along with 200 other people. And at least we were interviewed. We made it to the interview process, but somebody else got the house. And, and it didn't look like we were going to be able to get any living quarters. And I thought, dear Lord, what are we going to do? God sent us here. But we just continued by faith to trust God for the right house to open up for our relatively large family. And I'll never forget, we had uh, ridden around one day with a realtor when we had gotten there early. We only had about a month to stay in an apartment that belonged to some friends of ours, kind of downstairs in their home. And we were coming down to the last week. And sure enough, there was a realtor that we had looked at some homes with, and she found a relatively large house right off the highway, perfect location, right in the heart of the 
Burlington, Colchester, Essex area. And uh, she remembered, she said, I remember that family. I need to show them this house. So she never even listed it. She just showed, we were the only one to see it. And then we talked to the landlord. She happened to be working at the uh, University of Vermont at the time, had an interview. And I remember in my heart, I had peace, even though my head was in turmoil. What if we don't get this? What if this doesn't happen? But somehow in my heart, I had peace because we were acting in faith, trusting for God to supply. And you know what? We ended up with that house. God opened up every door. We were there for 10 years, established a wonderful church that was able to bless many, many people. And on the very last day we had to stay in that apartment, we moved into our new house. Of course, we know that the great faith chapter is Hebrews chapter 11. So I want you to take a look at some of these verses with me here. And let's look at verses one and two. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good testimony. Now the elders are talking about those Old Testament men of faith who believed God and acted on what he told them to do. But this first verse says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I've never liked that translation as well in the New King James as I do the New American Standard. There it says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction. I like that. The conviction of things not seen. I couldn't see it. I didn't even have the house yet, but I just knew that God had called us to Vermont. And on the basis of that conviction, we went not having any uh, house to dwell in as it were, kind of like Abraham going into the promised land, not knowing what was going to befall him when he went there. But we went in faith. And because we acted in faith, God responded to our faith and delivered us at every turn. And we ended up being able to establish that wonderful church there. But then he goes on to say that the elders obtained a good testimony by their faith. And as you begin to read through this entire chapter, you begin to see that these men believed what God said and simply acted on what he told them to do. Look at a couple of these verses. Verse 4 and 5 says, By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. We could easily say his works. And through it, he being dead still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Verse 6 tells us how. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So because of their faith, Abel offered up an offering that was acceptable to God. Because of his faith, Enoch seeked God, though he couldn't see him, because of his conviction in God's reality. So they acted on what they believed. Listen to verse 7. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. So what they're saying is, Noah entered into this covenant of faith with God because when God spoke to him about a flood, he was motivated by a godly awe and reverential fear, but also he feared the flood. He didn't want to get caught in that flood, so he acted on what God told him, and he built the ark for the saving not only of his household, but really for the whole human race. And then we get down to Abraham, the father of faith, in verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place that he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promises in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And friend, I promise you, if you go through this whole entire chapter, what you're going to find is they believed and they acted. They believed and they put feet to their faith. They worked out their faith through action. And it was their faith that justified them because it was evidence of a saving faith. No, we're not justified by works in regard to earning anything, but it's our works that are evident, our actions that are evident of a saving faith, a quality of faith that truly saves. Just like the woman with the issue of blood, just like blind Bartimaeus, just like the one who hears the gospel and responds to it by saying, I put my faith, my trust in Jesus, I'm committing to him. Friend, if you truly believe Jesus is Lord, if you truly believe that he's the one who's redeemed mankind, that he has a plan, an overarching plan for the world, but also you and I. He's got a plan for our life as well. You're going to commit your heart and life to him. You're not going to trust in your own plan. You're going to trust in him. Uh, the Bible said, we all like sheep have gone astray. We've gone everyone to his own way, but God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, that's the nature of sin. It goes its own way, but faith always goes the way of God, but it trusts in, it puts its trust in him, not in oneself. It puts its trust in him, not the broken systems of this world. And friend, I want to ask you today, do you have faith in God? Let me ask you this, have you put your faith in Christ? Have you put your trust and your reliance upon him? If I were to ask you today, how do you know you're going to heaven? What would you say? Would you say, well, you know, I've, 
I've, I've been a pretty good person. I've, I've, uh, I've got probably more good works than bad works. Well, then you're putting your trust in what you've accomplished, not what God accomplished for you. Now, friend, no, the Bible said by the works of the flesh, no one is justified. So your good works don't earn you anything. As we've said before, I'll say again, faith is opposed to earning, but not effort. And so in other words, we don't earn our way to God through our works, but when we believe God and we put our faith in him, it produces good works in our life that are the fruit of our faith. So we don't earn our way to God. None of the things you've done to try to please God or earn your way to heaven will merit you anything. But when you truly believe the gospel, you'll respond to it. You'll act in faith in line with it. And then from then on in your life, it will produce the good works of your conviction regarding God, his will, plan, and purpose for your life. My life has been a series of actions responding to the call of God because my faith is in him. Is your faith in Christ today? Have you put your trust in him? Why don't you do it right now? Why don't you respond to the gospel? Why don't you act on the good news of Jesus Christ and trust in him? Friend, I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. It'll be your act of faith. It'll be a way in which you can act on this good news of Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins to pay the debt that you could not pay. He settled the scales of divine justice, balanced the scales of divine justice on your behalf, and settled your debt. When he cried out, it is finished, that was a Greek word, tetelestai. It means paid in full. Have you put your faith in him? Why don't you do that right now? Just say this. Dear Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died for me to pay the penalty for my sins. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Be my Lord and Savior. I respond to your gospel and I confess you as my Lord. Amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, I want to hear from you. Would you email me at info at connectingpc.org? But before we go today, I want to pray for you. Maybe you have a need in your physical body. Or maybe you have a financial issue that's pressing upon you. You don't know what to do. Maybe you're oppressed in your mind and you have no peace or freedom because of the oppressive thoughts uh, that, that, are, that are clouding your mind and keeping you from enjoying the abundant life that Jesus came to give you. I'm going to pray for you and I want you to agree with me today that our living God still works the works that demonstrate he is the ultimate power in the universe to set you free. Jesus uh, came to set people free through the anointing that was upon him. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. What about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil? Well, friend, Jesus is still doing those good works through his church today. He told us, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. So Jesus is still working in the earth today through his church. So let's believe him actively now and participate in his redeeming work. Let's receive healing. Let's receive deliverance and provision in your life right now as we pray. Father, I pray for my friends watching this broadcast. Father, I pray that you would stretch forth your mighty hand as they're believing and responding right now to the gospel. Their hands uplifted, their hearts surrendered. We ask you, Father God, to minister healing to their bodies. We thank you, Father God, that this free gift of righteousness that is ours, Father God, comes on the same basis as the healing, as the blessing, as the provision, not something that we've earned, but something that Christ secured for us in his finished work, and we believe it. We receive healing. We receive deliverance. We receive provision. We thank you, Father God, for meeting every need. We command that cloud of oppression to be dispersed from the minds of those watching this broadcast. Father, right now I pray for strength flowing into the bodies of those that are weak. I, I just know there's somebody here, you've got weakness in your body. I don't know if it's from COVID. I don't know if it's from other kind, some other kind of condition, but right now God is just flooding your body with strength. We speak strength to that body, just the free gift of God because of the finished work of Christ. And we respond in faith to what Jesus did. And we thank you for that one being strengthened right now by your mighty power. Thank you, Lord, for strengthening their body, making them whole. We give you thanks and praise for all of this, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, friend, thank you so much for joining us today. Isn't it good news uh, that we can put our faith and trust in Christ? We can rely upon him. We can commit to him. And then our works will be a demonstration of that faith that saved us by grace alone. Thank God. And so, friend, I want you to go to the website, randylanebunch.org. We have an abundance of materials on our website. Under the media link there, you will find, again, our blog, our podcast, our magazine, past editions of our television broadcast. So many resources that will build you up in the faith. As we said, when you feed your faith, you starve your doubts. Just let your doubts die. We want you to take advantage of all of those resources. And again, we'd love to hear from you. So email us at info at connectingpc.org. Well, friends, thank you for joining us. 
uh, here on the broadcast today, and we look forward to seeing you next time on Connecting Point. Thank you.